Frankie de Jong is a versatile, top-class midfielder. We're going to look at exactly how he will fit in at Manchester United, what he would bring to Manchester United's team, and exactly what type of player we have on our hands. Hello and welcome to Stretford Paddock. My name is Joe. This is Alex Bagley. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. Very you ready good. to analyse Frankie de Jong? This lad right here. Get stuck right into him. Absolutely. So what do we know about Frankie de Jong? First of all, like I said before, he's a versatile, dribbling, passing midfielder. All action. Yeah. Does everything. He's been a 6, an 8, a 10, a box-to-box -box midfielder. He's been a sweeper. He's played centre-back. He's done pretty much everything. Yeah, We're going to look at a few examples and see exactly what he's done in the past under Ten Hag, what he's done at Barcelona, and what we can expect from him at Manchester United. Yeah, he's played a couple of different positions. Obviously, we mentioned Ten Hag. We're going to go into that. Also, what he did when he was under Ronald Koeman at Barcelona, yeah. and then into how he's played under Xavi as well. So he's done a little bit of everything for all these different managers. Exactly. Right, so the first thing we need to look at is his dribbling. This is yeah. one of the things that sets him apart from other midfielders in mm -hmm. Europe, his ability to carry the ball out. You see here, this is a relatively innocuous situation, receiving the ball in the defensive area there. That's his own 18-yard box, in case you hadn't worked that out. Yeah. Uh, you see the, the Germany uh, attacker pressing him here. And this is the sort of thing we see at United a lot. It'll be Maguire or Lindelof or sometimes Matic dropping in that role. Mm -hmm. And you, you're nervous straight away. Absolutely, you're thinking, yeah, this yeah. pass here is cut off. The midfielder's between the two men. What's he going to do? Well, here's what he does. Cut to the next picture. He just goes past him. Like You almost forget that that's a possibility, yeah. don't you? Yeah, it's that calmness under the ball that he's got there. Now, a lot of players, you see it, you know, Liverpool, you've got Fabinho and, and uh, Rodri that do this a lot where they pick up the ball from those deep positions, but they're more of a, you know, they'll pass the ball. Yeah. Whereas someone like Frankie de Jong has that option, but you can see here, a little bit of confidence to dribble it out. And you mentioned there, Fred and Pogba, we've seen it time and time again at Manchester United, where you're a bit nervous with them coming to pick up the ball up. That's where you end up having Maguire taking it out. You had Varane this year. And them kind of getting stuck in it all. Whereas if you've got someone like Frankie de Jong, someone that's comfortable taking the ball off the goalkeeper and then can't just find a, not just find a pass, but can dribble past the player. That's yeah. what United need. In 2019, he was like by far the best dribbler in, of, of any midfielder in Europe, pretty much of the top five leagues. That's according to Opta Pro, uh, distances of 10 metres or more, carrying the ball at his feet. Yeah. He was the best in Europe at that. Mm -hmm. This is the year he made his move to Barcelona. This is something he's genuinely brilliant at. It's not just like, yeah. oh, we can take the ball out. Like I said before, we've seen it with Fred and, and Pogba especially. When they receive the ball off the midfielder or off the goalkeeper, you're worried mm -hmm. where they're going to go with it. He's got so many options in his locker that you know you can have basically Maguire and Varane taking a day off because yeah. he's going to do that job for him, which is, is brilliant. And this is obviously in the much deeper role. So you can see here as well against Wales, further up the pitch, you start in here in the sort of second, third on that left-hand side, and he still manages to drive the ball all the way into the opposition's half, uh, you know, going past two or three men again, like all the way down. If you cut again further on, all the way right to the edge, basically, of the opposition's 18-yard box, and they eventually score from that, I believe, the Netherlands as yeah. well. He's just someone that can take the ball out in ways that most midfielders can't. Yeah, we're going mean, to look at his passing later on, but that dribbling with the ball, that driving with the ball, that's what kind of sets him apart from the other players and sets him apart. And again, looking at the positions he's going to play, it's mm. going to be important. You know, we're going to look at how Ten Hag's used him in the past. And it's maybe not the traditional number six or number eight. Mm. He needs that passing range, but also this dribbling that he does is a vital asset. Yeah, absolutely. And we talk about him being sort of press resistant, that, yeah. that term that gets thrown around these days. That's one reason why. Not just can he you know, pass his way out of trouble. If, if it's too much for him or the passes aren't on, yeah. he can just turn and dribble through players. And again, like we said, 2019, the most, and six, most successful dribbler of any central midfielder in Europe. He can do it at an elite level as well. Let's go on to this sort of versatility. We kind of referenced it and, and mentioned it a little bit already. But he has basically played everywhere. Absolutely. Like at Barcelona, uh, I think Coman was there when he arrived, or shortly after he arrived. He started off playing in a slightly more attacking role. <clears throat> when Coman came in, he said, I want him a little bit deeper. So then he goes from this sort of number eight, number 10, to a box-to-box -box player. He was originally playing in a double pivot with Busquets, uh, which later, like I said, moved into this box-to-box -box role where his stats just went you know, way up. Six goals and four assists in 14 matches after moving into that sort of wide right position. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing with him as well is, not just as he played box-to-box, -box, not just as he played uh, as a number six, he's also played centre-back quite a lot. It's ridiculous. Which is weird. He played centre-back quite a lot at Ajax. We've got a couple of pictures here of him playing in this sort of libero role, which is basically 
a fancy word for sweeper. Yeah. Like you see him there, he's the deepest player on the pitch for Barca, and this is against PSG when they've basically got their reputation on the line after losing yeah, yeah. Uh, 4-0 in the first leg. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the kind of thing we mentioned before with the, the confidence. He's so confident on the ball, you can put him in the deepest position on the pitch. He's going to take the ball off the goalkeeper, he's going to keep the ball in those positions. And like you mentioned as well, that press resistance. So many of our football, the football is Man United. You've mm. talked about, we talked about Fred, Pogba's obviously gone now, Matic. There wasn't this press resistance anymore. No. You, you know, they was either too slow, they weren't good enough on the ball, or just didn't have the technical ability. Someone like Frankie de Jong can drop in there, do that job, which is a, an amazing position to have. And well, whilst we're going to go on to this in a little bit, he might not be the n traditional number six, yeah. but can do a lot of those roles and might fit in with the players we've got at Man United. Yeah, you talk about playing from deep. It doesn't get any deeper than that. We've got another picture no. as well, where I believe he's literally the deepest outfield player on the pitch. He made 98 passes in this game. Ridiculous. 98 successful passes, 94% pass accuracy. I think it was 113 touches. This is elite level ball retention, passing, you know, keeping that game moving. That's someone, something we don't have. Absolutely. We don't have anyone that can drop deep into midfield or even into the defences we're seeing there. You talk about a number six. What's that? What yeah, number is that? What you number want. three. <laughs> like, we, we hear about all this. Can he play as a six? Can he play as an eight? He can play pretty much anywhere between the edge of your 18-yard box and the edge of theirs, and he can do it brilliantly. Like I said, away in Paris, yeah. 98 passes. That's the sort of thing United needs, someone who can control a game from anywhere on the pitch. Absolutely, yeah. Now, obviously, we aren't buying him to play as a centre-back, and I almost no. wanted to use that as an example to show you don't have to be a number six to be able to play from deep, to control a game from deep. This was his heat map as a number six uh, for Barcelona, where basically, yes, he's a number six, but... He's still covering pretty much every blade of grass absolutely. there, isn't he? You can see he's absolutely everywhere in that in, in that in that heat map there, and, and that's what that's what you need. Again, there's this this thing we're going to go on to how Ten Hag's going to kind of settle mm. with him. It isn't this traditional he's going to hold there's going to be players ahead of him. He does a little bit of everything. He is that box to box player. He does like to do what a traditional number six does of picking up the ball, but he also likes to get involved further up the pitch. Yeah. Get involved, link up attack. We saw in those other images of him, you know, setting up that setting up that cross for Holland the other day where they scored that winning goal. Yeah. That's what you're gonna get from Frankie de Jong. Yeah, exactly. And this is his heat map from last season. We've got a couple of quotes from Ten Hag talking about why he's such a good player. He said he's a wanderer, he's an adventurer, he's always on the move like a shark. Like a I like shark. That. I like a shark. Don't know what kind of shark, hopefully like a bull shark, not a basking shark, just one of the slow okay, ones that he's yeah. plankton. Uh, he said, with the ball often, but also without the ball. So if you put him on the number six, he's away too often. Then he said, but you need to give him the freedom, otherwise you can't get the best out of him. It wasn't an easy puzzle, so I decided to play with two number sixes. And we'll get onto that in a minute, talking about whether Fred or Donny uh, can maybe play alongside mm -hmm. him to yep. sort of cement that. Play with two number sixes and only one attacking mid. And in this way, we can also dominate the half space and force opponents to choose. He also said the quality of players decide how you will play. I think that's the crucial thing here. It's Ten Hag is a man who's got very strong structures and he's, he's very sort of clear in his philosophy. Yeah. But he's willing to change things within that, whether yeah. that's on the pitch or off it. He's willing to play players in the position they're best at without having to you know, force people into problems that you know, he doesn't no. know how to fix. No, it's, it's finding them their best position. He's yeah. mentioned that all, all the way through. He is someone that likes to drop in the ball. So if you play him as, you know, how we play players as an eight before with a bit further forward, you know, you look at City, how high up their midfielders are, De Bruyne yeah. and Bernardo Silva. There's, you're almost wasting him. You want him to be able to drop deep and pick up the ball of defence and dictate play, but you don't want him to be restricted to there because you want him in the final third and creating those. You need him in those positions. I think he's a, he's a great example, actually, of almost like a forgotten style of player. Like People, especially on social media, I think, are so keen for a number six to be someone that's tackling all the time, yeah. smashing into people, rearing around, racing at people, mm -hmm. when actually Michael Carrick was a number six. Yeah. And he didn't have you know, maybe the dribbling sort of prowess of Frankie Dion, but his positioning and his ability to play the ball and control games from deep made him a brilliant cover for the defence because the opposition just didn't get the ball. Yeah. I think that's what Frankie Dion does so well. Yes, he's got more of an attacking style to him, as we can see, he likes to cover everywhere. But his ability to pick the ball up from defence and actually show for the ball is something that we absolutely don't have at the moment. No, not in the slightest. And that's the thing that we're hoping to get out of Frankie de Jong. We want him to be that one that, that picks the ball with that bit of confidence. That's what Frankie de Jong is going to bring. Now, the next thing we'll talk about is his vision, which is kind of an elusive concept, really, isn't it? Yeah. What his vision is. It's seeing a pass, is it making a pass? I think of it as the ability to see the pitch, not just yeah, yeah. with the ball at your feet, but without it. This is a great example here. He, he picks up the ball... Um, here on the left-hand side and gets closed down by the centre-back uh, by their attacker 
instead of passing the ball or turning back to the goalkeeper, he isolates him one-on-one -on -one and drives at him. All yeah. of a sudden, he's got three passes on because he's taken players out of their normal position to close him down. And yeah. then he's got the ability, like I said, one-on-one, -on -one, he goes past him, and now he can play into the midfielder, out to the fullback, or up into that slightly trickier pass to the feet of the attacker. These are the fine margins where if he didn't have a dribble in him, yeah. all of a sudden this midfielder drops off, that's one lane covered, he can go to his man, and you've got no passes on. It's, yeah. it's about those tiny bits of technical excellence that mean now, instead of having nothing on, he's got three options on. It's just yeah. such a difference, isn't it? It is such a difference, and you've looked at, you know, there's players like this in the Premier League, who it kind of maybe compares to, and look at Thiago, what he can do, just drop yeah. in a shoulder, and it means that you don't have to play the simple pass, you know, that's what he's very, very good at, but dropping that shoulder means that he's got an easier pass, but can progress the ball, and it isn't just passing it sideways, and that's the difference between someone that's good at that position, where you can take it a little bit deeper, yeah. and someone that's very good in Frankie yeah, de Jong. Exactly, and this creates overloads in different positions where, like I said, you can, you know, sit with the man in front of you, I'm on the ball, I play a pass, that's one completed pass. Mm -hmm. But what it didn't do is progress the game, it didn't create any danger, it didn't cause any overloads or any, you know, problems for the defensive team. This sort of thing here, just squaring at your man, going past him, now you've got three passes on. It's only small, but it makes such a difference in terms of the ability to create chances over a long period of time. It's, I mean, it's, like I said, it's elite stuff. Absolutely. So the next thing is passing, then obviously as a midfielder, he needs to be able to pass. I think anyone who's watched Frankie Young for any amount of time realises he's an excellent passer. Yeah, he's got that range of passing. You can see this pass here that he's played in for, in for I think it's Dembele there yeah. on the left-hand side. A ridiculous pass that, you know, we've had players like that in the past. You know, we've had Paul Pogba who's got that passing range. And we almost need, we needed to replace him. You needed that creative play. You know, all the players we've been looking at or linked to uh, prior to Frankie de Jong were maybe these more destroyer players. Yeah. Someone like Frankie de Jong, you need to ha have that creativity that you're going to lose when you lose Paul Pogba into a, into a team. And when we're playing well, you need someone like Frankie de Jong who can create from a little bit deeper. Yeah. Whilst your other creative players, you know, your Danny van der Beek, your, your Bruno Fernandes, and your, your wide players in Sancho and Rashford, mm -hmm. they create further up the pitch. You need someone like Frankie de Jong who can play that pass. Yeah, you talk about his dribbling, but you pair that with his passing. He's in the top 17% uh, for passes attempted, the top 8% 8 for passes completed, the top 19% for progressive passes, as in he plays the ball forward more than 81% of midfielders, and he's also in the top 5% for progressive passes received. And that's crucial as well. We've got a couple more pictures if you want to just go through those of him playing balls in behind, you know, these sorts of passes out here yeah. into this space. He sees the space very well. This is back when he was at Ajax. Yeah. But that uh, progressive passes received is a big stat for me because that means he's in those little pockets letting the midfielders, letting the defenders, letting the goalkeeper pass yeah. to him. I think one thing that we like with Fred and McTominay especially is they're not great on the ball, we know that. But their willingness and ability to get on the ball in the first place, yeah. I think, is, is, is probably substandard. You look at someone like Paul Scholes or Michael Carrick, they were always free. Mm -hmm. Every time you looked up, you go, right, I know he's there, I can pass it to Scholes if I need to, I can pass it to Carrick if I need to, or I can take the risk, I'll just pass it to Scholes. Yeah. That's what he's so good at. Yeah. He's always available. You pass it one way, go around the other side of the defender, receive it again. And like I said, progressive passes received is in the top 5% in Europe, which is absolutely brilliant. So finally then, we've kind of discussed it as we've gone along, but how will he fit into Manchester United's midfield? That's the big thing. Yeah. We know he can play as a six. We know he can play as an eight. We know he can play in that box-to-box -box role. He can slot in at centre-back if he has mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Let's look here at a bit more of a direct comparison. So here you can see Fred and Paul Pogba up against Adama Traore. This is very, on, uh, very early on in the season. We won 1-0 against Wolves. I would say lucky to do so. Yeah, I think definitely. Wolves, you know, especially Trevor had an absolute field day. But you see two players here, both playing as, uh, in, in the number six role. Neither of them particularly adept at doing so. No. Uh, and you see here, Pogba and Fred both got their eyes on the ball, both get drawn in. Neither of them have the positioning or the awareness to drop off, cause a second sort of layer of defence. If we just skip forward a second later, He's passed them both and yeah, running into absolutely. absolutely open space. Like yeah. Frankie De Jong's positioning and awareness is crucial to sort of stop these things happening, isn't it? Absolutely, and, and someone that's more natural in that position yeah. and, and can control that. Now, hopefully, Ten Hag's going to get this, and it's going to be a little bit, bit of a tactical switch where he can kind of make sure that players like Fred and McTominay are yeah. better at doing that and recognising that danger. But someone like Frankie De Jong, who's used to playing in that position, used to being alongside someone, can kind of spot that. Also, the start of this was. That was all from Fred giving the ball away. That's true. You need someone with that bit, bit more quality in there that can do that. And then, if not, you've got someone like Paul, you know, Paul Pogba isn't the most naturally defensively. No. You can see here, he's been skipped past. 
that's where the problems lie. You need someone like Frankie de Jong who'll keep the ball, but also has the nous enough to drop back in, do that, and that's yeah. hopefully what you're going to bring in to see. Definitely. Um, and I think him next to Fred, I mean, the question, I'll get onto it, about whether we need another number six alongside him. Is he more of a replacement for Pogba? I think him and Fred could be somewhat of a competent partnership because yeah. you've got Fred who's sort of doing the leg work, who does more tackling, who does more off the ball work. Frankie de Jong's decent at that, but his numbers aren't sort of sky high in terms no. of tackling. He positionally is excellent. But I think if you had those two in there, like you said, you could have the passing, the ability to pick the ball up from the defence mm -hmm. that De Jong has. Fred can push forward a little bit more in those instances. And then when De Jong's on the ball dribbling forward, Fred drops in deep and covers those positions there. I think yeah. that could be a decent partnership. Are you a fan of that or do you think we need someone else? I think we'd like to see someone else. I think yeah. there's still a defensive hole to fill yeah. but you've got the likes of James Garner who could potentially come in and do that as well you can't just look Frankie de Jong and Fred isn't going to be the, t the team players that play all the way through the season they're not going to play 60 games together no. you need to have different combinations that work Fred and McTominay for people that have you know, have hated that for the past few years has been our most consistent and that partnership yeah. has worked they've at times the they've, they've done that people wanted more creativity and that was always the criticism and defensively there was also questions when we tried this you know Fred and Pogba against Wolves. That was what people were going, we needed this, this is what we wanted. Yeah. Pogba just didn't quite have it to play that role. You're hoping that someone like Frankie de Jong can bring the best out of Fred, can have that creative element that Pogba brought us, and also have that little bit of a nous. Now, whether we can get that other defensive midfielder in, whether that kind of fits in, I'm not too sure. But I think at this moment in time, I think already our midfield, I think, looks better mm. with Frankie de Jong in there. You've got Fred and Frankie de Jong. I think uh, Frankie de Jong with McTominay could still work. I think Frankie de Jong and Garner. Mm. And then we've got back to Ajax. You know, Frankie de Jong and Donny van der Beek played in those two sixes in certain games. Now, it's not going to be away at Manchester City where you're going to see Frankie de Jong <laughs> yeah. and, and, I think you might still and Donny see van der Beek. Fred and McTominay coming in for quite a lot of yeah, games. That could be that. But yeah. you've also got... Can Frankie de Jong fit in there? And that's a narrow three with Bruno maybe, maybe further forward. Yeah. They're the things we've got. You've got someone that can control the ball. You've got someone that can control the game. And hopefully that's a good partnership to hopefully keep off the season. Is. Yeah, very exciting stuff. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Can Frankie de Jong and Fred work as a number six if this deal were to happen? Let us know, again, your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you, Alex, for joining yeah. us. Let us know if there's anything we've missed. Frankie de Jong is a great dribbler. He's versatile. He can play in pretty much any position. He's a great passer. He receives the ball out of the pitch. He receives the ball off the defence. He He's seems mint. pretty good, doesn't He's he? Mint. He He's seems mint. really good. And if it weren't for the fact that Barcelona was skinned, we'd probably have no chance of signing him. So, uh, you know, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you in a bit.